this sort of is a nice segue because we've sort of talked about we've moved from basically biopsy to de best determine who needs active therapy, who needs active surveillance. We know that there is going to be these group of people that are going to be diagnosed with higher grade, higher volume disease. They will get managed however they will be managed. We're not here to discuss that. And then when they do get the biochemical recurrence that they get started on ADT, whether it be monotherapy or complete androgen blockade, but we know there is a subsegment of the, those people that will progress to the, this diagnosis of castration-resistant prostate cancer. So, and again, I think this has, been, this has been sort of what we've been talking about for a couple years. And, you know, Evan, I know that, that your name gets brought up in, the, in this paper of 2,600 patients and, you know, for a failed trial where a third of them were metastatic and, and people didn't even know about it. So I know you've done a heck of a lot better work than that. But, uh, but feeding off that, I think for our audience, I think we are understanding now that even when patients do progress to castration-resistant prostate cancer, part of it's the urology fault. We didn't identify metastatic disease early enough. Well, I think what you're, you, the point that you're bringing up is, is that um, when you have somebody on androgen deprivation therapy um, and their PSA starts to rise, that if you image them sooner, you might have this M0 CRPC space. If you image them later, most of these patients, you can have radiographically detectable metastases. With newer imaging, things like choline, PSMA PET, uh, FACBC, you might be able to detect metastatic lesions as with a PSA in the 0 0.2 to 0 0.5 range. So M0 CRPC is a, basically just means micrometastatic disease. Uh, it's a, a clinical disease state that will be a moving target on how large that disease state will be based upon how good our imaging is. And it could move the bar on how we treat these patients. Should we be treating them with systemic therapies earlier? Uh, by finding it earlier. We don't know that that adds benefit. Uh, more likely than not, people will want to consider utilizing these imaging modalities to say, well, we found an oligometastasis earlier that we couldn't find on a normal CT scan and bone scan. And what if we design a trial to respond to that by doing more aggressive surgery, by doing more radiation, by adding in systemic therapy combinations with ADT, maybe chemotherapy, maybe novel second generation hormone androgen path receptor pathway inhibitors. Um, you know, it's really quite an open field for investigation right now. Uh, the goal is, is, is that, you know, we're trying to help our patients cure more people, uh, help people live longer, but we do have to keep in mind that there's no free lunch in life. These drugs have toxicity, and while we combine these drugs together, um, our goal is just to wipe out all the disease, but uh, we have to do the studies to ensure that, that we're doing the right thing for the patient, and we're not just being ultra-aggressive, uh, giving more toxicity and not actually helping more people. We just don't know yet, so we have to do the research studies. I think there's a lot of nuance, too, uh, with this conversation and people listening is how you get to that state can be wide and varied, and sort of how you take newer data about what you do for hormone-sensitive disease that's metastatic, you know, you know, whether you give abiraterone or docetaxel based on sort of emerging data, and if you've got low volume, you've got high volume, whether this is the first time you've seen metastatic disease or these are people who've had local therapy and now brew it over time, these are all very nuanced situations and everybody has their own sense of what might be the right th therapy. Uh, but as Evan said, you know, these are areas that we have to sort of focus on to sort of see what's the right approach. So we know, uh, again, as we, as we sort of just move down this continuum of prostate cancer that, that uh, we have about probably eight to 10% of patients actually will present, will walk in with metastatic prostate cancer but have never been exposed to androgen deprivation therapy. And, and we know that based upon the charter trial and the stampede trial, that it seems for patients with, with higher volume uh, metastatic disease that the combination of androgen deprivation therapy and six cycles of docetaxel, actually those patients do better in terms of overall survival 
and delaying progression to castration resistant prostate cancer. Now there's, there's data now uh, that's been presented at, at ASCO this year looking at an extension of Stampede with ADT plus abiraterone. So Evan, you want to comment on that? Yeah, so there's data with uh, another arm in Stampede where the patients receive androgen deprivation therapy and abiraterone. Stampede is a trial uh, where there's a very heterogeneous group of patients. They're not all metastatic disease patients and they didn't uh, prospectively or pre-specify break down what we call high volume versus low volume metastatic disease. They just have the M1 disease state and there's a substantial proportion of patients that are M0, meaning they had maybe node positive disease at surgery or biochemical recurrence. And what they showed is a significant survival benefit for the overall population by adding, adding abiraterone uh, to androgen deprivation therapy. Um, if you look at the subgroups, the hazard ratio for the M0 population does slightly cross one. Um, so the, the benefit there we have, we have to consider and, and maybe consider the side effects versus the potential benefits there. But it all depends upon how you view the data. There are some people who say it was statistically powered to take the entire population and there's other people who will, will focus on the subgroups. I think the other thing is, is to just today, um, the latitude trial will be presented as well. And that's another trial that shows a dramatic benefit with abiraterone for patients with metastatic uh, prostate cancer, new metastatic prostate cancer. So I think the reassuring thing is that it's not just one trial, it's multiple trials. So the data's real, you know, it's been proved, shown and confirmed back to back. Um, so that's just another option for our patients. You know, should we be giving them ADT with docetaxel or ADT with abiraterone? Um, there's no direct head-to-head -head comparison yet. Uh, I would say they're both reasonable standards of care moving forward. I designed that trial in 1999. We could never get it done. Hormones, uh, Boskitaconazole versus Hormones Docetaxel. Now the time is for that. But uh, we don't know whether adding uh, all three of them together would be sort of the other approach that people would want to ask. But again, is that too much therapy? Or should you take high volume, get docetaxel, visceral disease, get docetaxel? But abiraterone is a very effective drug, can work in all those patients. So I think we just have to sort of sort out this data, look at some of the subgroups, as Evan said, and try to figure out what's going to go forward. The uh, leaning would be abiraterone is easier to tolerate in most people's mind, so they might just quickly shift over that way. Uh, in other cases, it might be a cost thing. If you have to pay out of pocket for two, three years, the cost of abiraterone, it might be easier just to get your docetaxel in quickly and sort of know that's going to translate to a survival advantage as well.